Welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. I know it's blistery and cold and rainy. Um, my name is Eileen Hart. I'm the events producer at University Bookstore. Um, thanks for coming out and supporting your local independent. We appreciate it. The more they cared, the harder they laughed. That may be my favorite quote from Norman Lear. He said and written and done a lot of important things. And he continues to say and write and do a lot of important things. But that simple sentence may be about the best definition of great American comedy ever. The more they cared, the more they laughed. Norman Lear cares about a lot of things. He cares deeply about the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence, and he saw to it that more of us had the chance to see our nation's birth certificate when he bought an original printing and sent it out on road trip across the country. He cares about the great liberal tradition in American politics, and as a political activist, he founded the advocacy organization People for the American Way in 1981. He cares about comedy and quality television and improving the civil discourse while entertaining us all. He is, most famously, the American television writer and producer who created some of the greatest television comedies of all time, including all in the Family, Sanford and Son, One Day at a Time, The Jeffersons, my favorite, Good Times, and Maud. <laughs> the more they cared, the more they laughed. And we did. We do. Not to put too fine a point on it, and when and whether anyone likes to hear themselves described as such or not, Norman Lear is an American institution, a national treasure, and the author of even this I get to experience. We also have Nicole here. Every Sunday in the Seattle Times, Nicole Broder brings us a conversation. Usually this means Nicole has a conversation, as she puts it, with a local who is doing something great or a great who is doing something local. In this case, it's a great. <laughs> Media personalities, big thinkers, visiting artists, colorful characters, and doers of all kinds. Perfect then, wouldn't you say, and very lucky for us tonight, we have Nicole Broder here in conversation with Norman Lear. Please help me in welcoming them both. Do you want to read a little before we get going, or what do you want to do? You're the man, you're the producer, you're the boss. I'm the boss. I want to thank you guys for coming. Two people just walked in. We should give them a hand. Yay! <laughs> um, they were expecting 300 and tell me there were we maybe 70. So we're not that successful, but we're intimate. Yes. I learned that backstage. I like the word intimate. I... I, I, I accept. I love this city. I've only been here four or five times. And, uh, but people are warm and friendly. And uh, I've always divided people, I think I say it in here somewhere, into wets and dries. Dry people are, are, uh, are uh, hard to know. They don't hug. Uh, if they hug, they don't hug well. You can cut yourself on their bodies. <laughs> and, uh, and wet people are warm, and they hug well. And, uh, and Seattleans, is that the word? Ites. We're uh, ites. We're not ends. When you're sopping wet. <laughs> yeah. Is, is what you Especially are. tonight, so. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, don't take it personally. It's just parking and rain. That's basically what Would you like on. me to read a little something? I'll read. Uh, I talk I write about my mother in here. I'll just tell you one short story before I read this. I, uh, I got a call one Sunday morning from a friend, John Mitchell, who was running the, he was president of the uh, Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. He said, Norman, I want to tell you, and I'm not supposed to do this, but we're friends. I want you to know we're, we met yesterday, and we are starting a television hall of fame. 
And these are the first inductees. William Paley, who started CBS. David, General David Sarnoff, who started NBC. Um, Milton Burrow, Lucille Ball, the greatest writer in television history, Patty Chayefsky, and you. I called my mother immediately in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Jeanette? And told her this, uh, Jeanette. And told her uh, this story. They started, they're going to start a Hall of Fame, and this is who's going to be in it. And she listened, and she said, listen, if that's what they want to do, who am I to say? <laughs> so... With that, this is uh, <laughs> this is one of my my uh, my favorite stories. If I can find it in small print, it in nineteen eighty seven. I was a 65-year-old man whose mother was coming to California for a visit. I sent a car to pick her up at her apartment in Bridgeport and bring her back to the American Airlines terminal at JFK, where I met her with a wheelchair and an attendant. She said she was happy to see me, but before I could reach her cheek to kiss her, she began to talk about Dr. Golden, her wonderful new eye doctor, and how could I not remember him? She told me about him on the phone a week or so ago. She was angry at me because I didn't remember Dr. Golden. Before her luggage was out of the car and checked at curbside, she had fished out of her purse the new miracle eye drops that Dr. Golden, God bless him, had prescribed for her. All the way up to the gate and onto the plane, she talked about that scratchy feeling in her eye that was gone now, how Dr. Leventhal, Golden's predecessor, had never helped her, and now she was eating uh, better and enjoying life more, and her mind off her eye problem, and did she feel, and did she tell me how, when she called my sister to rave about her new eye doctor, it was like she, she didn't hear a word I said. My mother loved her doctors. <laughs> Children, but doctors. <laughs> We were in this air alone an hour, I at the window deep into some reading, and she on the aisle, when I noticed her going into her purse again. At the same time, a young man was walking up the aisle, and my mother pulled at his sleeve. Sir, I wonder if you could help me? Certainly, he replies. As I, her quite grown-up, proven, stable son, looked on, Mother continued, my new eye doctor gave me these, this prescription. I have to put three drops, not four, not two. He, he said just three drops in each eye every four hours. Would you be good enough? Of course, he responded, taking the eye dropper firmly between thumb and forefinger. And as I sat there in a state between mind-bending wonder and apoplexy, he squeezed off three drops exactly, not two, not four, into each eye. A moment later he was gone and mother was putting her drops away, unaware, or so it seemed, that I was staring at her. In the world of comedy, what she did next would be called a take, a long, slow take. Very subtly, my mother star started reacting to something on her left, her son staring at her. What, she said. What? <laughs> Mother, I said, you asked a complete stranger for help when I'm sitting right here. I didn't want to bother you, she said. <laughs> I'm here, Mother, I said through clenched teeth. The son who takes care of you all year. You think I couldn't? Dr. Golden said you had to be very careful. <laughs> I was ready to explode. And did he tell you to ask a total stranger when your son is sitting right here and, 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 uh, and patient? <laughs> patient? I exploded. Since when can't I be patient? <laughs> she only had to look at me and say, some patience. <laughs> that was my name.
a press agent once, uh, some years later, got me in the, the, these, I don't know whether the Forbes 400 is for real these days, but a press agent got me listed uh, a good many years ago. I get a call from my mother after Forbes comes out. She lived in a building in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where the elderly people sat in the late afternoon and exchanged whatevers. And, uh, and she called one day and she said, how are you, sweetheart? I said, I'm fine, Mom. No, 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 I mean, really, you can tell me, how are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. There's something, do you, she said, well, you, you know, I, I'm worried about you. I said, why would you be worried about me? She said, I saw that magazine. I said, well, so? She said, I didn't want you to be upset. You were so far down on the list. <laughs> What did you call her, a full-blown narcissist? What, I beg your pardon? She was a full-blown narcissist. Is that how you described oh, her? Oh, she was the narcissist of all time. She's, okay. She only saw herself in yeah. this life. Well, there are people like that. Um, I was going to say, we need either really crappy chairs and for me to sit like this and you, you to sit like that, you know, like Archie well, and Well, I'm not going to do that for you. Archie and Edith. Or we needed a piano so we could sing. <laughs> I actually thought about like opening this with the all of us singing, you know, Boy oh, the Way Glenn really Miller time. played. You want to? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Boy the Way Glenn Miller, Miller played. Miller played songs, songs that made the hit parade. parade. Guys like, like us, we had, had it made. made. You know the words. Those, Those were, were the days. days. Do you want to keep going? And, and you, you knew, knew who you were then. Girls, girls were girls and men were men. Mr. We could use a brand like Herbert Hoover again. Didn't need no welfare state. Everybody pulled their weight. Dear our old LaSalle ran great. Those were the days. Yay. I figure if we didn't have a piano, if we didn't have, you know, I didn't want to bring a CD player and be a complete geek. But you have Norman Lear here. We're going to sing the song. I'm sorry. It's just, have you done it at any other readings or anything like that? This is the first time I've ever, <laughs> s I've ever sung this song. My, my <laughs> wife, Lynn, is here. I don't think she's ever heard me sing this song. So and now you'll remember we've been together 30 Seattle. years. That's Kathleen and Sarah. Come up and sit close. They're back there. Um, I have to also offer my condolences to your friend, Ben Bradley. You uh, guys were two of a kind. And uh, well, I'm sorry for I your loss. I love to think that because I adored him. He was great. But I... I talked to him four days ago, and uh, he was pretty much out of it. Uh, but he heard my voice uh, for a moment, and as he always did when he saw me or heard me on the phone, he said, Norman! <laughs> I and love that. I was thrilled. Well, may he rest in peace. Um, your childhood was decidedly unfunny, and when you were nine, your father was imprisoned for selling phony bonds. Your mother, Jeanette, a world-class narcissist, took your sister and moved, and you were sent to live with your Uncle Eddie and his family, and you paid them in laughs, pretty much. You kind of... I, I didn't hear the last part of that. I, this is not the easiest place uh, to hear. Well, you lived with your Uncle Eddie and his family, yes. you said, and you, you felt like you had to pay your way by making them laugh. Is yes. that correct? So, so I, 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 I've always loved film, and I used to see films when, you know, early on a Saturday afternoon, you go for a dime. And, uh, and I used to tell them, repeat the films, tell the stories of the film, mm -hmm. and act out the roles and so forth, which I realized later I, I was doing because I was living on the dole. I probably didn't know the expression at the time, but I was living in the homes I wasn't, you know, a part of families, though they were cousins. 
And so I paid back by making them laugh. I think a lot of my life began there. Yeah. My career began there. So that's where the funny came from. But you mentioned my Uncle Ed. Can yeah. I tell that story if you remember Absolutely. that Absolutely. Is this about the Yale game? I, that was, no, there were two. There was Eddie. I, know, I read too much. I, <laughs> I should have just skimmed, but I read the no, whole book. This was the guy who <laughs> taught me the greatest lesson I've ever, he told me the greatest lesson uh, uh, known to man. We were, uh, I, I was 11 years old. I'm at uh, Woodmont, Connecticut, where my uh, grandparents had a home. And the whole family used to gather there. My father was away then. He was in prison. And I was alone, and I was sleeping with about six cousins in one small room. And I got up at 5 o'clock or so in the morning to go to the bathroom. And I am doing that when the door suddenly is thrown open and it's banging, slapping against the wall. It was, you know, and it's my Uncle Ed, angry as hell. I, you know what you did? You just woke me up. I was peeing. You just woke me up out of a sound sleep and I'm gonna teach you something I want you to remember for the rest of your life. And instead, uh, he, and he started to do what I was doing but against the side of the bowl instead of uh, <laughs> the center of the bowl in the water. <laughs> when Ed Simmons and I started to work together, the first thing we wrote and attempted to sell, that's how I met the Ritz brothers trying to sell them, was <laughs> this long story that wound up with a truth known to man from the dawn of history, anywhere on earth, men understood that water sprayed on water makes a sound that all can hear, <laughs> but water sprayed on porcelain falls silent to the air. Everybody have that now? That's it. All right. Um, so your father was released and your family moved to Brooklyn? Yes. And there you wrote your parents, quote, lived at the end of, ends of their nerves and the tops of their lungs. The veins in your dad's neck bulged as he yelled to his wife, stifle yourself. <laughs> and you were the meathead, dead from the neck up. So that's where Archie Bunker came from. But again, I ask, where, where did the funny come from? Because it was a rough going for a little while. Is there well, a way to answer that question? Where the funny came from? The funny came from some sense of the foolishness of the human condition, which I think I learned the night they took my father away. He had gone to Oklahoma to uh, so, on some kind of a deal. He had flown to Oklahoma, which made it was a big deal to have deal, a father right? who was flying to Oklahoma at that time. It was, it was only four years after Lindy Lindbergh flew uh, uh, to Paris. So when a plane went by, rarely it happened, but when it did, kids in the street were yelling, Lindy, Lindy, it was always Lindy. It was then that my father was going to Oklahoma. And it turned out that he was selling a fake bond or something. And when he came back, uh, when they landed, he was arrested as he left the plane. And uh, that night, there were uh, a ton of people in the house buying the furniture my mother was selling because she couldn't live there in that state of shame. And, uh, and I'm sitting, I was going to go to camp in two weeks. So my mother had a roll of cloth tape that said, Nominum Lear, Nominum Lear, Nominum Lear, that she was going to sew into my uh, clothing that I took to camp. So I'm standing there, I'm clutching this, which was my uh, soul identity at the moment with my father taken away, my mother leaving with my sister, and, and some fool in the book I call him an asshole puts his hand on my shoulder and says, you're the man of the house now. How do you look at a nine-year-old kid in that state and call him the man of the house? Hmm. So I think that was the moment. I got some sense of the foolishness of the human condition. You know, there's a, however sad the moment, 
there's some uh, adjoining piece of humor. Yeah. Wow. So stuff for yourself and you being the meathead, that's where Archie Bunker came from. So talk about the first time Carol O'Connor came in to play Archie. Um, I, I read that he was channeling a cab driver, but tell me about that moment when he first came in because it was such a important and profound... Right. Well, he was... Uh, I was in New York auditioning, and uh, I had seen in New York, and Marion Doherty, a great uh, woman and, and casting agent, had suggested in a film that was made by... Uh, by uh, married to Julian, Blake Edwards, uh, I had seen a short little scene of, uh, called, the, the, the film was called What Did You Do in the War, Daddy? And there was a little clip of a colonel. It was, our, it was Carol O'Connor playing the role. I just fell in love with that face. So I was looking forward to seeing that face and auditioning that actor in California a week later. When he walked in and sat down, well, I was already in love with the face, but I don't think he read more than three lines before I knew that was it. Hmm. And I told him. He asked if, if and he, he was thrilled, but he asked if he, how long I was going to be there, and I had other people to audition, not for that role anymore, but I was going to be there a couple of days. He said, can I come back day after tomorrow then? came back the day after Mara, having written, rewritten the first act. Hmm. But I mean totally rewritten the first act. And uh, I said, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, this is not the character. And, and the other characters also. And uh, if you can't do what I've written, then, you know, well, there's no point in talking further. And on that basis, he accepted the role as written. But his sense of things was the same virtually every, with every script. Every, and not that he was wrong all the time. He was right a lot of the time. And we made adjustments accordingly. But so was Rob Reiner and mm -hmm. so was Gene Stapleton. And uh, we always sat around a table and made adjustments and changes and so forth. But where I thought it had to be what was intended, uh, there were often times when Carol just refused and we got into great difficulty. Well, you had some of your biggest battles with them. I mean, you had to threaten legal action when he didn't show and all this while he was turning into this huge star. So, I mean, I, I've, I've read about episodes where he wasn't comfortable with what he was doing. As, there was as one, Archie. Yeah, there was one particular episode that was taking See, place entirely one? in an elevator. Yeah. That, that one, yeah. Uh, and the story was, I forget why he had to be in a, a tall building on a high floor. But he got into the elevator and there was a black guy there, uh, very cultivated with carrying the, uh, we had such fun with this, carrying the uh, New York Times. Archie had the Daily News in his hand. And uh, and then it stopped at a floor, and, and a Latino couple got in. And she was extremely pregnant. She had just seen her doctor. She knew she was going to have the baby in a few weeks. Then the elevator got stuck. And with that handful of people in that place, they were stuck. The woman panicked and went into childbirth and had the baby. There were a lot of jokes of, you know, the attitudes were hilarious. But they were all in that elevator that amount of time, and a baby was going to be born. And Carol just could not imagine himself in that confined space with those people and the birth of the baby. And, you know, he, I don't know whether he thought we were going to sh show the birth of the mm -hmm. baby. But... Uh, I wanted the camera on his face as we right. heard the first sound of that infant. And he just couldn't see it. And that was the biggest fight we had. Really? And we made the show on Friday evening and started rehearsal on Monday. 
And it wasn't until Thursday morning that he finally went through all what he, everything he had to go through and uh, started to make, we started to rehearse the show, really rehearse the show. And I must say this, when it came to the dialogue, after he had slipped into the character and was Archie Bunker, none of us could write the dialogue as well as it just flew, flowed out of him. He, it was miraculous to see this happen. He, he wrote what was written. Right. I mean, he spoke what was written, but in ways we couldn't imagine. Right. Because he it. was Archie Bunker then. Because he just gave this little smile and he said, oh, it, it's a boy. Yes. And it was yeah. lovely. Yeah. You know, his whole face softened. You weren't sure, and then it was lovely. It was really... There were a lot. I mean, I, I just we just watched the other night where Edith goes to the bank to get a loan so she can buy Archie a TV for their anniversary. Mm-hmm. And it was a truly strong statement. There she was fighting for the rights of all women to get loans and that kind of thing. And I, I could go on and on about the groundbreaking, but I think... After 92 years, you probably know what you've done. You know, you've done a well, lot. You know, so thank you <laughs> for that. I, I hasten to say this was a giant collaboration. That particular idea, I, I don't remember where that, the idea for that show came from. But it sounds like something one of us uh, read about, that women and having more difficulty than men in the same situation in banks and so mm-hmm. forth. Uh, it's typical of what of what we were doing. Now we did it because we were serious people uh, who were trying to write and reflect the lives we were living, not the lives that you know we were making up as much as the lives we were living or reading about. And that was a real situation, right. and it made a, made for a real story. It was same with Edith and menopause and. Maud getting pregnant and that whole abortion mm-hmm. controversy and um, I think you had read about a woman in her 70s who had gotten pregnant or, or some such or maybe I think she had been raped and um, that's where that Maud episode yeah, no, came the, from. That episode was written originally uh, for One Day at a Time and Bonnie Franklin. Oh, no kidding. Who was very much younger uh, than, than uh, huh. uh, Edith Bunker. And uh, I don't remember why we didn't do it uh, in that show or at what point it happened, but we read about a 70 or perhaps older woman that was raped mm-hmm. and thought, it's important to tell that, you know, if you're going to do the story, it isn't about, and this was the key, it it, there were, and mostly males, I guess, who believed, because uh, you heard it all the time, well, how was she dressed? Right. You know, meaning that somebody was too sexy to be on the street without getting raped. Uh, and it's an attitude that still takes, uh, you know, is still a, a, a board in the land. And we were trying to show that... Uh, it didn't have to be young and pretty. But that, that's not what it was all right. about. Well, still, so you, your shows were taking from real life, your own lives, and what you read in the newspaper, what was going on in the world, whereas up to that point, television had been at a perfect little escaped, mm-hmm. escapist thing. So, um, you know, I think that's why we all just loved it so much because well, it was it our was in, lives. It was interesting too because yeah. we were accused of, uh, of uh, sending messages. You know, people used to say there's Western Union for yeah. messages. But preceding us, there was Green Acres, Beverly Hillbillies. And those were all true to life. I mean, you know. And those were... Didn't you, didn't you have a big yeah. water barrel that you hung over, Petticoat Junction and all that? <laughs> you remember <laughs> But the biggest problem anybody has in those shows was, you know, mom is ruined, the roast is ruined, and the boss is coming to dinner. <laughs> uh, but that didn't, wasn't that a wall-to-wall, floor-to-ceiling message. We don't have economic problems in America. There's no such thing as rape. There's no such thing as, uh, as cancer or breast cancer or, 
we live with our problems. But you had a transgender person on your show, yes, on All in the yeah. Family. I mean, it, it, you know, that was what, in 1976 or something like that, uh -huh. when Edith lost her friend Beverly. So, <clears throat> I mean, you were way ahead of your time. And, um, well, you, you know, know how that came about because I wanted to do a show. Edith's faith was very important to her. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that without ever to say a word. I mean, that's the way she read to uh, audiences everywhere. And I wanted to do a show about her losing her faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, that person that she loved, who we'd only seen a few times, was killed in the story we told for being who she was. Right. And Edith couldn't believe in a God that would see that happen. Right. She lost her faith. Then we spent weeks. Uh, could, we couldn't air the show with her losing the faith without knowing how and having the script for her regaining her faith because there was no way to play Edith forever mm -hmm. unless she had that. And it, that took some weeks until somebody that w wasn't even working on the show asked the innocent question, well, when Edith loses her faith, what happens to Archie? And Archie, we realized, goes to pieces right. because he depended on her strength. Right, right. Um, which of your characters do you most identify with? Who's closest to you? I know, it's an amalgam, but but uh, because she was a liberal, and I am, uh, I guess Maud. Maud, I love Maud. And because she didn't also uh, know what she was talking about all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and I've noticed how true it is of me also. I'm expressing giant feelings sometimes without really having the on-the-ground backup. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, that's the way I exist. Mm -hmm. I loved her. Um, and which, which character did you dislike the most? Did I like the most? Dislike. Oh, dis I, I know you, they're all your babies and you hold them close and dear, but were there, was there one that you just kind of wanted to slap around a little there bit? There wasn't. I can't think of a, uh, an ongoing character okay. uh, that I disliked. I think I loved them all. Yeah. Um, what would, we, what would we be surprised to know about, and I'm just going to reel off a few people that you've worked with, what would we be most surprised to know about Frank Sinatra, in your view? Uh, I made a film, uh, Come Blow Your Horn with Frank Sinatra. Uh, probably that he was a great guy, <laughs> because so much is written about <laughs> how difficult he was. Uh, I had one experience, uh, he was, people thought he was difficult because he would say when you're making a film uh, and you want to do another take, he refused to do another take, you don't need it. Well, but we should do it again because the cameraman uh, says he thought he heard a sound or the sound engineer said he thought he heard a sound, a plane or something. And Frank's response to that was, my mother in New Jersey won't hear that. <laughs> so we couldn't. Anyway, there was a scene. I was on the set. They did a scene. My partner, Bud Yorkin, was directing. And, uh, and I can't remember for what reason I said, I think we should do that again. Bud agreed. And so we would, they started to do it again. Frank said, no way. And... Uh, the only way we could settle it was, I said, well, let me look at the dailies tomorrow, and uh, maybe you're perfectly right. But it was, a, it was a question of the way the scene was played. It could be better. Mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he was in a makeup chair in his dressing room. I was in my office when I called him, and he took the call uh, to say, Frank, I looked at the dailies, and we really have to do that again. He said, no way, pal. I said the scene doesn't work as well as it could work. We, we're going to do that. We have to do that again. He said, I said, no way. We're not going to do it again. And, uh, and I, in jest, I yelled, I said, we're going to do it again. Oh, no, no, no. 
I said, we're going to do it again. He said, you give me one reason why. I said, because I fucking said so. <laughs> and I got scared to death. He, he, oh, he, he said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what scared the hell out of that's me. That's great. I didn't intend for that at all. Oh, you know, I was, but that's great. What will we surpri be surprised to know about Gene Stapleton, who we lost recently in love, love, love? And when, I don't want to make you cry. I know how much you love her. When uh, somewhere very early on, uh, sometime very early on, somebody asked me, what's Jean Stapleton like? And I heard myself say, she's always where she is. And I don't know whether at the time or days later or whenever I thought about that and how remarkable that is. And, uh, and I started to get some great insights into myself also from huh. that. She's always where she is. When Jean was talking to you, there was no place else and there was nobody else in the world. That was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the avenues uh, to my learning and thinking about there was a time when I had five families on the air and one on Mooncrest Drive. And uh, I was a far better father at the time to the families on the air than right. I was to my own family on Mooncrest Drive. Yeah, there was, that was my, one of my favorite paragraphs in the story about producing something to put out mm -hmm. and being on the outside looking in. I'm producing something and being on the inside and much of your life you said with regret was that you produced it from the outside or from inside, you know, yeah. for the rest of the world. So, um, you know, obviously that's changed for you and that's what a blessing that is. It's good. Well, we'll have, I have to ask my yeah. wife. For, and there's for Lynn really right there. Family. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd have a couple more people. Who would we, what would we be surprised to know about B. Arthur? Who was also a that gem. Her sense of the foolishness of the human condition was the, was the wisest, most profound sense I knew. That's what made her absolutely... And she didn't know it. I'm not talking about some intellectual thing. She just responded to every... I had a grandmother in her way mm -hmm. who just got it. Yeah. You I know. loved her. She was... You know, that's the thing. I mean, I think a lot of us watched your shows with our parents and heard about abortion and religion and politics and, and race issues and all these things. And it was okay to watch it on your shows. And it gave us a way to talk about it. But I, I again, I thank you for partially raising me to become this <laughs> crazy-ass liberal that I am. You're anyway. a good kid. <laughs> um, you're founder of the People for the American Way, yeah. which is a civil liberties adv advocacy organization which opposed the interjection of religion in politics. And I wanted to just thank you for that. And thank you for fighting thank Robert you. Bork being on the Supreme Court. That, that was a good thing you did there. Um, but you and your wife, Lynn, are also the owners of a Dunlop broadside. Um, which was one of the first published copies of the United States Declaration of Independence. You bought it in 2001 for $8 million. And I love the story of how you realized that it was available and we got to get this thing and you were crazy on the phone. What was it like to see it for the first time? I knew, I had heard that it was, uh, for, it was going to be auctioned off by Sotheby's uh, on the internet, which was the first, nothing like that had ever happened before. And... Uh, I called because one of my kids was in school, one of our kids was in school with uh, a kid whose dad was ran Sotheby's in Southern California. And I called him. I said, tell me about this. And he said, uh, come on over. It's in the showroom and take a look at it. Well, it was a walk uh, for, at lunch uh, to that showroom. And I walked in with uh, a young woman I still work with, Laura Bergthold, and it was sitting on a, uh, on a an easel. And uh, 
I hoped she didn't see me crying. I looked over, she was crying oh. too. So I spent, uh, we toured it, 50 states was, I was determined to make every state, and most states we uh, toured multiple, multiple times, in different cities all the time. So I stood any number of times and watched families from around the corner waiting as long as 90 minutes to get to the document and, uh, and a lot of wet eyes. And teachers, a uh, number of teachers who would say uh, they had hoped to raise the money to take their class to Washington to see such documents. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was in their court or mm -hmm. in their at the university in town, or they, it was it was wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that with the, with everyone. That's what a gift that you was. Know. You know, it's just a. I can't imagine the first time you set eyes on it. It would be. That. No, I, I, we no longer we sold it. Right. After about ten so years and covering all the, and uh, please don't say China. Huh? <laughs> Where is it? No, I think I think uh, we auctioned it off, but they had a couple of people they had to introduce to it to because they knew they meaning Sotheby's, and I learned only within the last few days that it's probably Bill Gates who bought it. No kidding. And we we sold it because we just needed our foundation was running dry, and we needed to uh, oh got move it move on okay. to other things. Can we call Bill Gates? Does anybody have his phone number? Yeah. But he's, Mr. Got Gates, letters, Mr. Gates he's got is letters a from uh, Napoleon to, um, uh, what was her name? Some, Joseph, Josephine, was it? Who's he's that? Got, Bill Gates has letters from Napoleon to Josephine. Oh, so I understand. Yeah. Yeah. He's got some beautiful things. We well, should he's call him. He's going to build a museum. Yeah. Okay, this is my last question, then we're going to open up to questions. Um, you have a font of ideas, and you told me one of them. You still have a lot of work to do, Norman Lear. Um, and one of them focused on a new show, focused on people in their 50s or so, which is... 60s up. 60s up. Retire and and I mean, what, retirement. Is it, what is the title and the concept? The title is Guess Who Died? <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> You know, you, you either believe that one Betty White makes an entire demographic. Right. <laughs> it's true. Because that's what's, uh, what's uh, reflected on television today. And I want to see, and I've written and I love, a group of characters. Well, we know of Brent Miller is sitting here, and uh, we work together. And Brent's mother lives in such a retirement home. As a matter like of fact, she was World living there. or something like huh? that? Leisure World? Is she in Leisure World? Like Web oh, God. Okay. A Dell Webb community. Uh, she was single there. She met a single uh, fellow there. Uh, the story of uh, how they came together and married is hilarious. <laughs> uh, and he went down there and, and filmed for three days and came back with all this footage of these people living these great lives you know, running around in in, uh, in golf carts, dancing their their uh, hips off, <laughs> yeah, and falling in love and uh, and so forth, and getting a lot on of the phone, getting a lot of STDs, from what I understand. I'm saying, but it's actual scientific. It's not not your mother. I don't nothing against your mother. I'm just saying, like these are these are facts. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Me and my STDs. What else you got? <laughs> So good, and then you said something to me about having another, like a, a some kind of a service, a, like a spiritual service that would be, you know. Oh, this is this is church. a very good place to mention this. <laughs> <laughs> I have for a great many years. Uh, the technology hasn't been there until recently. Uh, but I thought about it a great many years ago. I want to do on Sunday morning a non-denominational uh, service that honors the, the, the reverence we have uh, or should have for one another, uh, recognizing our common humanity, suggesting that 
everybody's religion be where it belongs, mm -hmm. in the heart of the individual, in the confines of the family, the, the, the church, the pew. The, but in the outer world, uh, share that uh, love of our own and each other's mm -hmm. humanity. Uh, we now have the technology. Motion picture theaters across the country, tens of thousands are wired to take a digital signal. So we could do a service with the most kick-ass music, uh, the greatest choirs, the great preaching on, uh, on the subject of our common shared humanity. Uh, and I think given that uh, we have managed through the ages to kill one another in the name of God in greater numbers than anything else, that we could use a non-denominational service that brings us together around our common spiritual spirituality. That's a great idea. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then you said then we could all go out to eat after. That would be great. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to open for questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Come on up. I think. Do you want to use the mic up here, Eileen? Yes, I can. Hi. How are you? Good. I apologize when I hollered out Michelangelo. It was Hodex. You know, Bill Gates owns that too. American oh, really? Codex. He put that on display at the Seattle Art Museum. I was hollering that out when you were talking about it. Okay. Napoleon. Got it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just was going to say, um, Mr. Lear, that uh, the current issue of Vanity Fair has that Seth MacFarlane tribute to you. And it, he mentions in there that we could not see these shows that you did in the 70s today because of the controversy, because we, what has happened to us. And I just wondered whether you agreed with that and why he would have said that. Well, according to, I'm not involved in uh, television at the moment or uh, or uh, cable shows or you know networks uh, but those who are men and women who are uh, showrunners as they put it on various shows tell me they couldn't do this, some of the subjects today too politically correct do you have a question well, first, I want to thank you for coming. And me and nostalgia go so far back. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. And there is an episode I don't know, like the back of my hand from the, everyone knows the Sammy Davis Jr. I also know when Archie sees a black man coming through the cellar when he was intoxicated. And he said, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was one of my favorites. And I can go on down, even from Green Acres, Mr. Haney. And I grew up on this here, and growing up in Memphis, I even knew, because my mom was one of Elvis' background vocals of Sweet Inspirations, so I knew that he was big on Sanford and the Sun, which I have all these here nostalgias. And when I heard you were coming, my wife now, she's 20 years my senior, which is great, and <laughs> my mom talks about these things that we grew up on, Rita Haywood, we grew up on the Jimmy Stewart's, the Kurt Russell's, and all, you know, the Burke Lancaster's and stuff. And when I knew that you were coming, and I heard you on the radio today, and I heard that, I ran, and here I am suffering from bronchitis, and I had to come down here and say hi to you. Because that's the, that's the homage that we give for us to television today, that they don't make them like that. The creator isn't created like that. And yes, it, it touches so many emphasis on so many outlets in the world and stuff, and how sheltered we've gotten from opening our doors to people, speaking to your neighbors. In Memphis, everyone still knows who their neighbors are, 10 streets down and all that stuff. But I just had to come and just say thank you for helping me grow up. And my mom and Elvis, like I said, I knew you used to watch Red Fox and the Jeffersons <laughs> because I was around there. So, you know, we definitely think, and I had to come here and just at least tell that to you of all things I had to, just had to. I, Yay, yes. thank you. <laughs> Great. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We have another question. You can go. I wonder if you could comment on some of the recent trends in television in the 21st century, like reality shows and so on. Oh, Lord. You like, you don't like. Uh, 
I, I, I really, uh, I've not watched, I don't think I've watched five reality shows in, throughout, through the years. I, I know they turn, I, maybe I shouldn't say it because I don't know enough about it, but what I've seen turns me off. I don't care about them. He doesn't watch Scandal or anything like that. Or, neither do I. Oh, okay, neither do I. Or the housewives of this kind of place or that. <laughs> But their TV is becoming more, you know, dramatic and, and you know, Breaking Bad and, and uh, House of Cards and do you, do Transgender, you know, we talked about that. Do you know about um, Transparent? Yes, Transparent, that's what I oh, mean. Fantastic. That's, the, that's one of the great performances of all Jeffrey time. Jeffrey Tambor. Yes. Yeah. Do you know about it? How many people know about Transparent Transparent here? is wonderful. Isn't it fabulous? It's on um, Amazon uh, Prime, yeah. streaming, whatever. So that's a touchy word around here, Amazon, but um, it's very good. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Right there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Norman, great to see you in a church here. Um, <laughs> It had been said, and I'd read, that the uh, demographics of the audience for uh, uh, All in the Family were about half that uh, uh, saw Archie Bunker as uh, someone of a buffoon and would look at it from a certain thing and have a funny thing, then half of the audience actually thought he was doing a good job. And uh, is that, it, it sounds like that's exaggerated, but is, is that in the ballpark of the truth of the demographics of the audience? I, I don't know uh, what percentage-wise at all. Uh, but certainly there were people who said, right on, Archie. But I can tell you this, I never received a piece of mail from anybody who was expressing right, the right on Archie point of view who didn't also say something negative about the people who were presenting it. Like, go back to where you come from, you bastard. Or, I mean, uh, ugly things. Uh, it, it didn't miss people's understanding, even if they cared about them. And, and by the way, on the other side, I cared about them. This was somebody I knew very well, and, 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 uh, and I knew lived down the street, up the street, across the street. Uh, I, I think I understood America pretty well, presenting Carol O'Connor as Archie Bunker. He lives among us. I do want to congratulate you on this string of success. How were you surprised at how instantly successful All in the Family was? Uh, it just took off immediately, and then no, the it show... didn't. It didn't. It, oh, didn't. It, as a matter of fact, if it didn't go on in January, uh, it might never have been picked up. What happened was, if it had gone on in September when the season started, oh, because. Uh, it wasn't until it went into reruns when ABC and, C and NBC went into reruns on their shows, more people came to the show they'd heard about, but a, uh, uh, CBS, in which it played, wasn't as successful in the half hour preceding as the other two networks. It was third. And so people came to it afterwards. And then... Uh, uh, Johnny Carson, doing the uh, Emmys, suggested, I understood it to be his idea, that the Emmys open with what they called a cold open, a scene from, that showed the Bunker family just before they turned on the television set to watch the Emmys. Oh. That, was the, that was the introduction to the Emmys that year, and it, you know, between the two things, it... it raised the profile of the show, and it took off. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for probably two more questions. This woman here. Thank you. First of all, this is beyond belief, being able to be in the same room with you. Um, I saw the very first episode of uh, All in the Family with my mom sitting next to me. We had no idea what was coming. And... <laughs> When the disclaimer came up on the screen, she looked at me, because I was only a young teen at the time, and I looked at her like, please, you know. And <laughs> it was off to the races, and that cold opening for the Emmys, I remember jumping for joy going, 
finally somebody gets my life. Because I was exactly like those people waiting for the Emmys every year. Um, my question is, I was listening to you today on the radio, and I use the Cairo app, which doesn't always work. So they talked about the sentence that you fought to have included in All in the Family that, that almost cost you know, the, the, the series, I guess. And just as they were about to tell the sentence, the app caught out, and I didn't get to hear it. So I was just wondering if you could share that again in the story that goes around that. You mean the... The, the Mike and Gloria one, I think. The, the piece of dialogue that they... Yeah, it was... Was excised the... from... It was... Uh, the story in the first episode of All in the Family was a very simple one, deliberately simple, because I wanted to show 360 degrees of the central character. The way I used to put it was, we're going to jump into the water and get wet. You can't get wetter than wet. This script gets us wet. So it was a simple story about them returning, this, Archie and Edith returning from church early because he hated the preacher and the sermon. Uh, and, the, and, and the young people in the house alone decided to go upstairs and make love. When they heard the door open and uh, the bunkers return, they came running down the stairs but you could tell at the moment what that moment was all about. And Archie, what he, the way he put it was, 11.10 of a Sunday morning. <laughs> That's all. They wanted that out. Why did they want it out? Because it made what was happening specific. What do you mean? Well, they were obviously upstairs to make sex and they thought that they were, and they came running down. Well, they're married. <laughs> What's the problem? Uh, we were looking for the laugh off of the attitudes. Not that it was terribly funny in itself, but Archie's attitude was funny. And uh, 1110 of a Sunday morning was funny for that reason. Now, could the show have lived without that line? Easily. It was funny enough, it didn't need that one laugh, bit of laughter from that. But I guess I was close to 50 or 50 then. I mean, I was not a kid. And I guess I understood that if they win, I don't like to put it in winning and losing, but if they get their way with this little argument and I have to take out that line, I'm gonna lose sillier battles than this. I had to protect uh, the future of, of the scripts we intended. It wasn't the line itself, it was the moment. So that show, they were threatening to take that line. It was running obviously three hours later and uh, uh, earlier in New York. We would learn about it you know, before it went on in California. And it was 20 minutes before it went on in New York that I learned they were leaving the line in. Because I said, if, if it's out, I'm, uh, you won't find me the next day. But again, I want to repeat, it wasn't such a, it, it wasn't, oh God, I got to win this for the sake of winning it. It was just a simple, common sense understanding that if I give in to this silliness, I'm going to have to do it again and mm -hmm. again and again. I was wondering if there's any mentoring going on um, on your behalf or you, the other geniuses really in comedy writing what do you feel the future is for young comedy writers today? Because the, I, a lot of the, t what I see on TV is not nearly as funny as what you produced. And I just wonder, is there any kind of programming that you can really point to and say, this is a good, a good place for people to be if they really want to go into comedy writing? Well, I love South Park. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you officiated at Trey Parker's wedding, didn't you? I, oh, yes, I did. <laughs> he got married in uh, Hawaii, and Lynn and I flew to Hawaii to marry him. That must have been a fun wedding. It was, it was great. 
it was great. And they, I think what they do uh, up to, and especially including, uh, the Book of Mormon uh, on Broadway. I don't know if it's been to Seattle. Oh, yeah, the, twice. The production. It's, you know, it's a gift of sanity to the world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Seth MacFarlane, we're great friends. I love what he does. Modern Family, I think that's some excellent comedy. And I wish there was more. I wish there was more political humor. Uh, but as, as somebody else asked me and I re responded, uh, this is uh, a, uh, the political correctness is, uh, my favorite way of wording it is, uh, is uh, we, we've lost, uh, America used to laugh at itself more. Uh, we don't, we take ourselves too seriously now. And as a result, you know, the foolishness of the human condition prevails. That's an interesting dichotomy, isn't it? Yeah. Well, as with everything, I blame the Kardashians, so. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's in the car. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody. Norman Lear, you've raised most of us. You did, oh. you did, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much. That was terrific. I, I enjoyed being with you, Nicole. I enjoyed being with you. Well, you're just a swell guy. And you're you? fun. And the hat, would, do we need to explain the hat? You used to write and scratch your head. And one day your wife came home and... Put a hat on my head. Said, Put a hat on your head. Yes. And Save your scalp. Don't <laughs> How many of those do you order a year? Uh, I had... Uh, About 80 of them? Uh, I, no, no. I had uh, a half a dozen. I lost the original. And uh, in front, in the, we were in Paris. There was a hat maker. I don't know of a hat maker in, in L.A. How many does he have? And, and I ordered six of them. And maybe I have three left. Well... I hope someday they belong. They'll belong in the, the Smithsonian or something With like that. With the chairs. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks for coming Thank you to all. Seattle.